In a few hours, I will likely be dead. My men and I, Nords of Skyrim all, will soon join the Emperor's legions to attack the Imperial City. The Aldmeri are entrenched within, and our losses will be severe. It is a desperate gambit, for if we do not reclaim the city, we will lose the war. Last night I prayed to mighty Talos for courage and strength in the battle to come. The horns are blowing and the banners are raised. The time has come to muster. May Talos grant us victory this day, and if I am found worthy, may I once again look upon the great feast. East Hall. Over the centuries, the Imperials of Cyrodiil have often relied on their northern allies for aid in conflict. We can see this sentiment in the rousing words of Scarred and Free Winter, who faced insurmountable odds at the Battle of the Red Ring. He is not alone in this sacrifice. When the Great War broke out between the Empire and the Aldmeri Dominion, General Jonna's Nord armies were exalted for their exceptional contribution in retaking the Imperial City. The forces of the Dominion had sacked the city, and when they attempted to break out to the south, they were blocked by the unbreakable shield wall of General Jonna's battered legions. Meanwhile in the north, opportunistic Reachmen had capitalized on the Empire's war for the homeland. The Imperial Legion stationed in Skyrim's western reaches had been called back to Cyrodiil to deal with the Aldmeri Dominion. The Reach's capital of Markarth was vulnerable, and the Forsworn took it with ease. Retaking the city was vital to maintaining a stable realm, yet the Empire was stretched close to snapping and couldn't spare a single battalion for the task. They instead called upon a Nord militia led by the mighty Ulfric Stormcloak. A fascinating account of this Force One uprising comes from an Imperial scholar, whose conspicuous biases give us a good idea of the Empire's sentiment at the time. It claims, In all the bravado and epic yarns the Skulls compose of his exploits, you would think Ulfric to be a giant of a man, equal to that of Tiber Septim in his cunning, leadership, and decisive actions. But the truth is far more revealing. Before a peace treaty could be resolved with the Forsworn, a militia led by Ulfric Stormcloak sieged the gates of their capital Markarth. What happened during that battle was war, but what happened after the battle was over is nothing short of war crimes. Every official who worked for the Forsworn was put to the sword, even after they'd surrendered. Native women were tortured to give up names of Forsworn fighters who had fled the city or were in the hills of the Reach. Anyone who lived in the city, Forsworn and Nord alike, were executed if they had not fought with Ulfric and his men when they breached the gates. You are with us or you are against Skyrim, was the message on Ulfric's lips as he ordered the deaths of shopkeepers, farmers, the elderly, and any child old enough to lift a sword that had failed in the call to fight with him. The truth of the incident is unclear, obscured by the bloody malaise of wartime. What is clear is the fact that the Nords were promised freedom of religion as a reward for the recapture of Markarth, but all they received were empty promises. In one fell swoop, the Empire revealed their willingness to bend to the demands of the Nords, and then immediately cede their authority to the Altma, denying the Nords their prize, and going so far as to arrest Ulfric to prevent the ire of the Dominion. The Empire in their desperation may have hoped imprisonment would scare Ulfric into staying in line, but as that same Imperial scholar noted in his account of the Markarth incident, against the bear of Markarth, Ulfric Stormcloak, no is not an answer and they would soon discover the folly of their actions. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. We recently answered the question, who would be better to rule Tamriel, the Empire or the Old Mary Dominion? And today we have a similar question to ask, who should rule the province of Skyrim, the Empire or the Stormcloaks? We've already covered the major mistake which served as the catalyst for the Stormcloak Rebellion, but we're only at the tip of the iceberg, because the war for the North would brew to boiling point over the coming years. Throw off the shackles of Imperial oppression. Do not bow to the yoke of a false emperor. Be true to your blood, to your homeland. The Empire tells us we cannot worship Holy Talos. How can man set aside a god? How can a true Nord of Skyrim cast aside the god that rose from our own heartland? Mighty Tiber Septim, himself the first emperor, conqueror of all Tamriel, ascended to godhood to sit at the right hand of Akatosh. Tiber Septim, a true son of Skyrim, born in the land of snow and blood, bred to the honor of our people, is now Talos, god of might and honor. The Empire has no right to tell us we cannot worship him. 
In the immediate aftermath of the Markarth incident, Ulfric was in no position to start a rebellion, for he was imprisoned. He even missed his father's funeral and was forced to smuggle a written eulogy out of prison. Understandably, the tension was building in Skyrim and inside of the embittered new Jarl of Windhelm. He was soon released to take up his deceased father's mantle, but this would do little to blunt Ulfric's anger. Ulfric would not rest so long as the Empire dictated how the Nords lived and carried out their worship. In the very same Stormcloak recruitment essay, attention is drawn to Skyrim's High King, who like many of the province's Jarls were staunch Imperial loyalists. Our own High King, Torig, betrayed us to the Empire. He traded our god for peace. He agreed to a pact with the Falmor signed by an Emperor in a foreign land. Are we to be beholden to such a pact? No, a thousand times no. Torik had been named High King around the same time Ulfric became Jarl of Windhelm. Ulfric and his allies in the Palace of Kings would argue Torig was unfit for rule, but he was heir apparent, so the traditional moot held to determine a new High King was only ever a formality. At the moot, Ulfric announced his desire to be independent from the Empire, and while the request was a substantial one, Torig respected Ulfric as the war veteran he was. But Ulfric was running short of patience, and the next time he came to Solitude's Blue Palace, it was to challenge the young monarch. Ancient Nordic traditions forced Torig's hand, and the two dueled. The young High King was no match for the war hero's Fum, and while sources are divided on whether it was the shout or the sword that defeated Torig, they couldn't deny that, honourable or not, custom dictated that Ulfric was now rightfully the High King of Skyrim. But this would count for little with the province in the midst of civil war. Unlike the Imperial account of the Markarth incident, this particular display of Ulfric's brutality is not skewed by the Empire's bias, and his brash actions are important to consider when determining who should rule Skyrim. Sybil Stentor, Solitude's court wizard, reaffirms this idea. She knew Torig well, having raised him as a youth. She was convinced Torig's admiration for Ulfric would have added a lot of credence to Ulfric's request. Independence from the Empire was absolutely a possibility without needing to take Skyrim's throne by force, and Ulfric's failure to exhaust diplomatic alternatives would be a stigma forever attached to his character. Regardless, Ulfric had achieved his goal, his rebellion was in full swing, and the Empire could not count on peace in the North. No sooner than the blood of High King Torid had dried, Ulfric took flight back to his seat in Windhelm. The Jarls of the Rift, Winterhold and the Pale favoured the rebels, while the Jarls of the Reach, Fulcreef and Hjalmarch chose the side of the Empire's candidate, Torig's widow Jarl Elisif the Fair of Harfinger. Skyrim was split in half, in the east were the Stormcloak rebels, in the west the Imperial Loyalists. With the Aldmeri Dominion choosing to take a backseat to the conflict, the civil war could go either way. Perhaps the outcome would rely on the choices of one individual, the last Dragonborn. But we're not going to analyse the civil war itself. We could break down the approximate sizes of each army, the leaders and strategists involved, even the landscape of Skyrim and the defensive capabilities of the major cities. Instead, we're going to look at each faction's claim to Skyrim, and their potential to better rule the province. Under whose governance would the populace be most happy? Who would best protect the Nords from the alarming ambitions of the Aldmeri? Dominion. Well, one thing is clear, if the Empire were anywhere close to being as powerful as they've been historically, the Stormcloak Rebellion would have been snuffed out in a matter of days. This civil war is only possible because the Empire is near breaking point. The Battle of the Red Ring may have been a triumphant success, with the Imperial City restored to the Empire, but the Great War did not end well for the Imperials. It's important to remember that the Imperials also venerated Talos, and were it up to them, the free worship of the Nine Divines would be allowed but the Empire finds itself in a position where they have to take orders from the High Elves, lest they provoke another war and be destroyed completely. The White Gold Concordat was signed by Emperor Titus Mede II to buy time for the Empire to rebuild its military strength. The tenacity of the Red Guards in their ongoing conflict with the Dominion has indirectly benefited the Empire greatly. The Empire may have buckled under the Dominion's pressure, but in Hammerfell, the war dragged on for five more years, and the terms of the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay were far more favourable to the Red Guards than the terms of the White Gold Concordat were for the Imperials. Nevertheless, with the Dominion losing numbers in the deserts of Hammerfell, the Empire were given enough respite to recuperate their legions. They were now able to defend their southern borders while also committing forces to the war in the north. As of the 201st year of the Fourth Era, both sides are evenly matched. A classified Falmer dossier says, As long as the civil war proceeds in its current indecisive fashion, 
we should remain hands off. It seems the Falmor have elected to allow their enemies to weaken one another. Given enough time to recover their strength, there is a strong case to be made for Imperial control over Skyrim. The Empire have experienced governing foreign lands. Skyrim itself has been a part of the Empire multiple times, dating back as early as the First Era. Portions of southern Skyrim were conquered by the Elysians, but it was Reman Cyrodiil who won the support of the Nords entirely, bringing them willingly into his united Tamriel. Tiber Septim achieved the same feat, bringing the Jarls of Skyrim into the Septim Empire. But these old iterations of the Cyrodiilic Empire were far more dominant than the Mede dynasty of the Fourth Era. Even excluding the potential assassination of Titus Mede II, the Empire in the present day aren't capable of inspiring the same degree of loyalty that Reem and Cyrodiil and Tiber Septim were. How could the Empire properly govern Skyrim when they could only just muster enough men to protect their southern borders from the looming threat of the Dominion? On top of this, no matter how famous Imperials are for their diplomacy, they can't expect to understand the wants and needs of the Nords the way a domestic ruler could. How about the Stormcloaks? Starting a rebellion is easy, but establishing order and stability when the swords are sheathed is another thing altogether. The sons and daughters of Skyrim are renowned for their ferocity and enthusiasm in battle, and Ulfric Stormcloak, the figurehead of the Nordic Rebellion, is just as skilled in rhetoric as he is in combat. The faction's recruitment essays and oaths are full of emotive language, and it's easy to see how the target of such speech could be inspired to join the ranks of the Stormcloaks. The text called Nords Arise says this about the Rebellion's leader. Like Isgrimor, Ulfric Stormcloak is a true hero of Skyrim. His name will ring in Sovngarde for generations to come. Only he had the courage to single out King Torik and challenge him to trial by arms. Ulfric's Fum, a gift from Talos himself, struck down this traitorous ruler, and by his death we are now free of our imperial shackles and the Falmor overlords that darken the imperial throne. The Empire has sent its legions to govern us. They have enlisted our own countrymen to their cause. They have set brother against brother, father against son. They have caused Skyrim to battle itself in their name, for their cause. Do not let them divide us. Do not let them conquer us. Reject the Imperial law that forbids the worship of Talos. Join Ulfric Stormcloak and his cause. To those with an alternate perspective, these stirring words could be translated as Ulfric ignored diplomacy to pursue violence. He abused his form to slay a young High King. And now the Empire is trying with all its might to maintain order by uprooting the weeds of revolt before they can grow out of control. But which story is more inspiring? Should you join the Stormcloaks, you will pledge the following oath. I do swear my blood and honor to the service of Ulfric Stormcloak, Jarl of Windhelm, and true High King of Skyrim. As Talos is my witness, May this oath bind me to death and beyond, even to my lord as to my fellow brothers and sisters in arms. All hail the Stormcloaks, the true sons and daughters of Skyrim. But does effective rhetoric translate to effective governance? We also know that Ulfric Stormcloak is a decorated military leader, and his relentless unyielding demeanor could be exactly what Skyrim needs in the face of elven aggression. But the argument can also be made that, if the Imperial accounts of the Markarth incident are accurate, combined with his impetuous handling of High King Torig, Ulfric may be far too brutal to ever win over the affections of the entire province. He is considered by Empire loyalists to be brutal, controversial and divisive, and a ruler who is incapable of showing mercy is on the precipice of becoming a tyrant. There is also the unavoidable reality that a Stormcloak-controlled Skyrim is not an ideal outcome for other races in the province. Nords in general tolerate other races, but they aren't particularly fond of diversity, and Ulfric famously forbade the Argonian population of Windhelm from entering the city. He has also shown his indifference regarding the Dunmer situation in the Grey Quarter. For a Nord, however, the Stormcloaks without a doubt have your best interests in mind. Not the Empire's interests, not the Dominion's interests, but the Nords of Skyrim's interests in mind. When comparing the Empire with the Stormcloaks, it's akin to comparing a handshake and a fist to the face. The Empire are realistic about their intention to maintain control over their vassal provinces, and they are full of compromises. The Stormcloaks, on the other hand, make no compromises, and will resort to war before making a single sacrifice. Both qualities have their advantages and their disadvantages, but I believe, given the current circumstances in Tamriel, one is preferable to the well-being of Skyrim. The cold, sharp edge of the blade may not be as pleasant as a signed agreement and a handshake, but in present-day Skyrim, the time for appeasement has passed. 
the Stormcloaks see the threat of the Aldmeri Dominion, who pull the strings of the weakened Empire, and they juxtapose it with the plight of Isgrimor and the Atmorans against the Snow Elves. Do not let the lessons of history go unheeded, the text warns. The Aldmeri Dominion and its Falmor masters made war upon men, just as the Elves made war upon Isgrimor and our people in ancient times. Shining Sarfol was burned to the ground, reduced to ruins and rubble in their treacherous assault. But Isgrimor and his sons gathered the 500 companions and made war upon the Elves, casting them out of Skyrim. In the great war fought by our fathers, the Elves again betrayed men by attacking us unprovoked. The Dominion and the Falmor cannot be trusted. Talos worship is one thing, but another key argument in defense of Ulfric's rebellion is the scheming of the Dominion. Ulfric's detractors will be quick to point out his brash and blustering neglect for diplomacy, and it's hard to defend Ulfric for what he did to High King Torig. But if we put it into this perspective, his haste makes much more sense. Ulfric perceived Torig as another pawn of the Empire, like his father Islod. He had no way of knowing Torig may cooperate. And even then, would it matter whether Torig was willing to consider his pleas for independence, when every passing day gave the Falmor more time to tighten their stranglehold on Tamriel? If the Dominion aimed to conquer the whole continent, and the Empire were acting as their lapdog enforcers, what could the Nords do other than fight? A young and inexperienced king would likely not be able to deliver Skyrim from the imposing threat of Falmor aggression, but a grizzled veteran, gifted in war and rhetoric, with firm policies on border protection and the protection of human values and religion, well that seems like the ideal candidate for such trying times. Ironically, it would seem that a united Cyrodiil and Skyrim would be the true best hope for preventing further Aldmeri dominance. But the Empire's greatest boon can also be their greatest weakness, for they are in the heart of Tamriel, and they cannot hope to shut themselves off from the Dominion's pressure. Skyrim, on the other hand, they share borders with the provinces of High Rock, Morrowind, and Hammerfell, all of which are free from Aldmeri taint. To the north lies the Sea of Ghosts, a hazardous voyage for even the most agile ships. And to the south, between Skyrim and Cyrodiil, lies the perfect natural defense, the rugged steep slopes of the Jaral Mountains, which has scarce few traversable passes. If Skyrim is to remain a land free from Altmer interference, where a Nord can worship their gods without persecution and pass their own laws, not the Dominion-influenced Imperial laws, they must emancipate themselves from the Empire. This is a reality that Ulfric Stormcloak and his Nord rebels understand. And while the Stormcloaks are an inexperienced faction in the political landscape of Tamriel, they are a product of the desperate times. And for the good of Skyrim, the Nords should rule their homeland. When Kain the Sky Goddess breathed life upon the summit of the throat of the world, the Nords were born, or so the Nordic tales say. These same sons and daughters of Skyrim, Kind's breath in mortal form, are the key to securing a free, independent, and prosperous Skyrim. And there you have it guys, the Empire versus the Stormcloaks, and who would be best to rule the province of Skyrim. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I know that this is a very subjective topic. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments about why you think one faction may be better to rule. Thanks so much for watching guys, I've been Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.